Next week, we hope to have the insert in the bulletin uh, for preparing our hearts for communion. Um, is that right? What is the date today? The 14th? 18th? Yeah, that is right. Yeah, I, you, I can tell that I'm getting August and September. I'm surprised I haven't gotten October in my mind yet. Uh, this is what happens when you prepare in advance. Um, yeah, next week will be the preparation uh, insert, and then uh, September 8 will be... Uh, so that's going to be kind of a full day. Um, so my request is that as few of you that need to be over at the park preparing, because uh, we will be having communion that same day here. This week, uh, we're looking at the fruit of abiding, and then next week, we'll be looking at Psalm 90, the seasons of abiding, uh, ending the abide series. And then we're going to uh, start a new series, September 1, um, on uh, inward prayer. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to just divide, it's a really lengthy series, but I'm going to divide it. We'll, we'll work around Advent and different things into next year. Um, I I don't know that doing the series all at once. Um, but we'll first focus on inward prayer, then upward prayer, and then outward prayer. Okay? Um, my desire is that all of us can get just beyond God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food and drink. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> or... Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And now I know how traumatic it was to actually pray this. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Um, and, then I, and then the church introduced uh, our Father who art in heaven, right? And we're going to get beyond the stated prayers that sometimes... Um, we don't think about because we've said it so often and uh, talk about the power of prayer. Amen. John 15, beginning with verse 1, and we'll go through 5 and then skip to verse 16 and 17. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version, um, which has a lot of that heavy-duty abide language, okay? This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and that's us today. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Now, by the way, um, we get a little confused in the English language, but when you, uh, when you trim down a vine, um, it's called trimming or cleaning. Pruning. Yeah, or pruning. Um, but in the... Uh, the Greek language, it's called cleaning. And you kind of get it. When you prune, you see all the stuff that's laying on the ground that gets gathered up. Um, there's a lot of stuff. In fact, sometimes it looks like there's more stuff than the actual vine itself. Um, um, my, Mary and I, our first call um, was to Iowa. There just happened to be, it was the wrong soil, by the way, for, a, for that kind of grape. But I asked the neighbor, it was, it was right on the lot line when we moved into the parsonage, and big, beautiful grapevine, no grapes. And so uh, I went out there, uh, I think it was February, March, when you're technically supposed to prune uh, grapevines. And I went out there and I just cleaned it royally. And uh, neighbors came out, what are you doing? You're killing the plant. No, and that, I could not believe, usually it takes a couple of years, but that, that summer, um, the grapes came so fast that we had to run to them because um, they burst. They were growing so fast, and when they burst, all the wasps and bees came out, um, and so you had to be careful. Um, but it didn't look like that beautiful, you know, it, it's, it didn't look like that spray that you would buy at Hobby Lobby anymore, <laughs> right? But there's a lesson in that for us, right? It doesn't matter how nice of a suit you're wearing today, how nice you look, or a beautiful dress. What God cares about is what kind of fruit are we producing? Not how he doesn't say how many leaves do you have. 
He says, How, what kind of fruit are you producing? So just kind of remember that. And um, my, my folks actually had a, a vineyard, um, and they grew for Welch's. And they had so many years of killing frosts that um, it started not to pay for itself anymore. And so what used to be a vineyard is now all these huge trees. Um, and the property taxes now get paid by the alfalfa that's grown in the field. Local farmers come and take it for horses and, and cattle. Um, no more grapes. If there are any wild grapes out there, they don't have a chance because that's where all the deer herds hang out. And that's like, you know, that's like a piece of pie to them. They love grapes. They probably like blueberries too, right, Adam? Do deer like blueberries? Yes. You can't get them to pay for them either, right? No. I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean. Be there's that word clean. You are pruned or you are, you've had all the stuff cut away because of the word that I have spoken to you. So when we read God's word, sometimes it hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Just like a pruning uh, of the, the, the vine. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, don't be offended by that. You remember what Jesus said of himself? Apart from the Father, I can do nothing. And he was, he was and is the divine Son of the living God. Apart from the Father, I can do nothing. And now he is saying to us, apart from me, you can do, I'm the vine. So, um, technically, you can cut trimmings um, and propagate them, certain kinds of grapes. But this is not the science of today. This is when you cut a branch away, it dies, right? It's no longer connected to the stump or the vine. And verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, we've talked about that before, um, that's not a hocus-pocus magic trick. That's um, in my name means according to the will of the Father. He may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. Now there is a deep-seated divide between our Christian faith and the cultural values espoused in Western Christianity. We want to follow Jesus as independent contractors, but Jesus himself teaches his disciples, including us today, that he cannot do anything for the benefit of God's kingdom apart from faithfully following the Father's will. Now, Jesus also teaches us that the Holy Spirit can do nothing unless the directive comes from the Father or Jesus himself. And just as there are no independent contractors apart from Jesus, there's no spiritual fruit produced apart from Jesus, our vine. We cannot produce spiritual fruit from good intentions apart from Jesus. We are not capable of producing kingdom fruit, or as the scripture says, fruit that will last apart from Jesus. I love that term, a fruit that will last. How many of, in the summer months, we, we buy fruit, we put it in a bowl, if it doesn't have to be refrigerated, what happens if we leave it there too long and don't get to eating it? Fruit flies, yeah. Where do they come from? They, they fit through the... Uh, <laughs> they fit through every little nook and cranny, don't they? Yeah. 
They find a way. Let's think in these terms. Um, let's all become farmers for a moment. The prophet Isaiah points to the coming of Jesus and his relationship to the Father and the Spirit by saying, in this passage we know from Advent, out of the stump of the line of Jesse, the father of King David, will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. Yes, yes. There's a stump, but there are roots still working. And we know this. It's usually the trees that we don't want when we cut them down and haven't removed the stump. It's the, usually the trees that we don't want. They'll, they'll shoot right back up, right? We had a Chinese elm in the, our backyard growing up, and what a messy. It was one of the trees from back when the house was built that was left from the woods. And it was right next to the garden, and it ruined just about everything in the garden. And one winter, um, an ice storm split the tree in half, and in the spring we cut it down and thinking, good, it's done. And I even, I, I confess to you, I even put gasoline on top of the stump. I was just watering it. It shot up and right <laughs> came right back. The trees that we don't want are like weeds. They shoot right back up. But Jesus is saying, Isaiah is prophesying there is someone who's going to sprout from that old stump. Even King David opens the songbook of the Bible, the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, and then we catch a little phrase in 92. I'm going to add the 92 and I'll tell you when. Especially for those of us who are older, we need to still be connected, right? Oh, the joys of those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never, never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And then in 92, verse 14, we read, Even the godly in old age will still produce fruit they will remain vital and green. So what David is saying, um, if you're looking to gather your 401k, you're going to be deeply disappointed in the Christian faith. There is no retirement from the Christian faith. Yes, yes. Even in old age, we are promised to bear fruit for God's kingdom. Ever been taking a flight and you look down and you see, especially when it's more arid or even farmland, a lot of times you'll see the trees growing on property lines, but where do you see the trees that just kind of cut through all the farmland doing their own thing? Along the rivers, right? And it's good to have those trees there. And they survive even the worst of droughts because their roots are connected to the waters in the river. Jeremiah says the very similar thing. Blessed are those, in Jeremiah 17, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made their Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. We cannot fool God regarding the fruit of our abiding. If we are genuinely living into the way of Jesus, it will show by the condition of the fruit that's hanging from our branches. This morning we read for a call to worship some of these words. Jesus reminds us in both Matthew 7 and Luke 6, you identify false disciples from true disciples by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. 
a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. Now some of this may be painfully obvious to, you, to us. And it might be a little scary. Have you and I ever produced bad fruit? Yeah. I have. Yep. I'm going to guess that you have too. So can a good tree bear bad fruit? It can. It can go through a season producing bad fruit, right? You know what? Um, we talked about that last week, about halvesies and trying to, trying to find a bargain with God. I'm glad you bring it up. Can, well, and sometimes that happens to a tree, right? Sometimes part of it gets ruined by something and the other part produces. And so the farmer says, well, we're going to make good on this. And they may have to cut it down depending on what caused the other half. But we don't, we can't reason with halvesies. We can't do halvesies with God. Right? right? <laughs> we want to. And that's, that's the stuff of our genuine faith meeting up with our cultural Christianity, right? Folks, I'm, I'm sorry, but our cultural Christianity... I, I'm convinced that if Jesus came to the United States today and looked at the church, I don't think he would recognize the, the faith that he gave us. And I'm not tisk tisking I'm just saying, examine the heart, right? Um, let's just be honest. And we can't fool anybody by this stuff. But don't crumble in fear over this stuff either. That I think I, it's not my job to scare the you-know-what out of you right? It's the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts. And before we crumble in fear over the times we failed to faithfully produce good fruit, we need to remember God's patience with us is the opportunity for us to change course. That is, and, and, and we may say, God, can we go have these on this? <laughs> Do I need to tell you what he's going to say? Well, you can try, but you're spinning your wheels. The answer is no. And then if we keep trying, it might become like a parent, right? Have you ever said to your child, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> I, I want to be real careful here. I, I don't want to make light of this. Um, Maybe you say it from time to time. Holy crap! Or something even like that that Pastor John's not going to say in church. Before we go, oh, I can't believe he said that. I want to give you an opportunity. I'm, you know I got a sense of humor. I got a warped sense of humor. Um, but if I wrote my own Bible, um, if I wrote my own Bible, in uh, the heading, I mean, if I wrote it in a way with, you know, the, when you open up the, the Bible, even the ones in the pews, they have tiny little headings over sections of Scripture. I'd put holy crap over this passage. And, I, and I'm being completely serious. If somebody ever says in your presence, holy crap, instead of going, oh, or even the word, you know, you know, yeah. Sherry knows it because it, yeah. the first two letters are the same as her name. So, <laughs> we brought that up on Wednesday, by the way. That's just say if somebody says "Holy crap!" instead of going oh, "Go," you know what? God's word talks about holy crap. It does. Yes. Luke thirteen. Jesus told this parable, this story, 
a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. So here's the landowner talking to the gardener. Just cut it down. Three years, cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. Now you've got to remember that in, in, in the farmer's don't plant a bunch of trees just so, oh, look at how beautiful they are. It's using up valuable space, right? You, produce, you, you, plant, you plant plants and trees to produce fruit because that's what pays the bills. That's what feeds people. The gardener answered the landowner, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Which means the gardener is saying to the landowner, I'll cut it down next year. Let's see what happens in the next year. Now, I want to cut to the chase. When Jesus shares this parable story, we are the tree planted to produce fruit. God, our Father, is the landowner checking in uh, to see how well we are doing at living into our purpose, that is, to produce fruit. And the gardener is Jesus with the Holy Spirit tending to our needs in order to faithfully produce the fruit we have been created to produce. The tree in the story is trying to produce fruit without the necessary nutrients in the soil. Does that sound familiar? I'm just glad they didn't, Zondervan didn't put a Bible together with my picture in, in, on the side of this passage, right? That's the guy right there. He tries to do the Christian faith without God's help. Did you notice the gracious patience of Jesus, the gardener, when the, God, the landowner, does not find any fruit on the branches? What does the gardener do? He says to the landowner, Sir, give it another chance. I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. Now, sometimes the terms that we use can give us false impressions. The New Living Translation joins the New International Version in being nice and making it sound like the gardener would stop at the local farm and fleet, pick up a couple of bags of fertilizer. But that's not how they do it on the farm. The contemporary English version reads, Master, I'll dig around the tree and put some manure on it to make it grow. Yeah. The gardener is proposing, holy crap. I'm going to give it some holy crap. I... I know this is hard, in this, and again, there is no disrespect intended. But imagine with me today, it would be like Jesus saying to us, I'm going to get out my super duper pooper scooper and generously apply crap into the foundation of your soil yes. to awaken your roots to produce the kind of fruit you've been planted to produce. Yes. Now, Mary and I did li live when the kids were young in Iowa. You don't have to live in Iowa to smell this. You, you always know when the manure is being added to the soil. <laughs> in Iowa, you don't even have to be downwind. <laughs> it's just all over. You just go, and if you have sinus problems, it's all cleared up. Now, I, I, want to, I want to take this a little step further. How many of us want to have crap added to our life? I've got enough, Pastor John. I don't need any more. Could it be that the crap we face from day to day might actually be the manure that Jesus puts into our soil to wake up our roots to produce the kind of fruit God has intended for us to produce all along. 
When the Apostle Paul writes his letters to the churches of Ephesus and Colossae from a dark, musty prison cell in Rome, he views his suffering as that kind of crap, but as a part of a greater plan that God has for him and the church. Listen to what he writes in Ephesians 1. Please don't lose heart because of my trials here. And for us, that could be said, do not lose heart from the trials of all the crap you're putting up with. Yes. Right? right? Don't lose heart. I am suffering for you, Paul writes, so you should feel honored. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. And I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources. Think again about the landowner providing the resources to the gardener. He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That sounds just like the definition of abiding. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Amen. And then in Colossians, we similarly read, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. This is Colossians 2, beginning with 6. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Yes. Yes. So what are you going to do the next time somebody in your presence says, holy crap, it's, it's an opportunity for testimony. Oh, you know God speaks about that in Luke 13. I'm being serious here. Because... They may, well, I know you're a Christian. I was expecting you to go, oh, I can't believe you said that. Instead, use it as an opportunity. Well, God talks about holy crap in Luke 13. And it's the stuff in our lives that we have a choice of how we're going to deal with it. Because the last I check, we can't avoid the crap of real life, right? It, the more we try to avoid it, usually the more trouble we get into. And really, all of this is Paul's encouragement about G what Jesus even said of himself. For us to bear the kind of fruit that shows what is produced when we genuinely abide in Jesus Christ as a response to Jesus abiding in us. It's almost as if Paul is writing a definition of what it means for Christ to abide in us. He says, Jesus empowering us with inner strength through his spirit, making his home in our hearts as we trust in him. That's the language of abiding. That is the powerful language of Christ abiding in us. Richmond Church, we are God's orchard of fruit-bearing trees or God's vineyard of fruit-bearing vines. God is providing all the nutrients we need to bear kingdom fruit. That is, fruit that we can put in a bowl and the fruit flies have no say in what's going to happen. And the fruit will not get mushy. It'll stay good. It's kingdom fruit. When we abide in Jesus and let Jesus abide in us and we let our roots grow down in Jesus, letting our lives be built on him as he empowers us with strength through his Holy Spirit. Jesus making his home in our hearts as we learn to trust in him with strength for today and as the hymn says, bright hope for tomorrow. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's pray. God, we are blessed as we learn to trust in you. We are like trees replanted in the new Eden, putting our roots down near you, the river of living water, never worrying about the long, hot days of summer, never dropping a leaf from stress, always in blossom with your word, staying peacefully calm through life's droughts, bearing kingdom fruit in every season for your glory. Find us today growing tall in your presence, flexible and green, still healthy and strong, even in old age. Amen.